So we're going to look at images of power today, um, but also we're going to be looking for um, variations in, in how Gothic architecture is different from Romanesque. So we're going to be looking at um, appropriation, so taking characteristics of Romanesque and altering it, and then innovation and experimentation. So how do they alter that church formation um, to impact the religious experience? Okay, so the Gothic era is a time period that we characterize from about 1150 to about 1300. Now, that is primarily the time where we call it the age of the cathedrals. So this is where there's a continuation of con um, church construction. So we know that the Romanesque, right? There was a, for a hundred years, there was this massive building campaign to build these big, wonderful churches along pilgrimage routes. That continues in the Gothic era, right? Remember, people are super excited. They beat the millennium, right? They survived. They thought it was going to be the end of days. And thank goodness, they all survived. And so in, short, in order to show their religious fervor, um, they donated to the construction of these really large churches. And so we normally think about Gothic, once again, as being an architectural style. But there also is um, other um, types of art that come out from this, this time period as well. Sculpture, really develops around 1220. And then painting happens in a couple of different places. Um, in Italy, it happens around 1300. And in the north of the Alps, it happens even later, so around the 1400s. So you can see that it doesn't mean that there was no sculpture and there was no painting during this earlier period. It just means that the style that we study today happens a little bit later. There's a lot of money and concentration of that money in the building of these large churches, right? So the theme for Gothic, the theme for Gothic is called the quest for height and light. So the quest for height and light. Okay, so height. Churches get even larger and they become more, uh, more um, vertical. So there's an emphasis on it becoming more heavenly, okay? Um, one of the, the things that we'll notice is that we will have the introduction of pointed arches in construction. And so this is the time of the Crusades. So Europeans are going to the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and they are trying to conquer in the good of Christianity these lands of um, Islam or the lands of other religions. And they are coming back with objects and information. And so they learned from Islamic architecture that a pointed arch is much stronger than a rounded arch. And um, they use that to allow for these ceilings to get even taller. Also, visually, a pointed arch really does direct your viewer's eye up to the top of the structure. So it's good for support and visually, it creates an emphasis on ver verticality, right? Um, they strengthened the ceilings with ribbed groin vaults. So if you remember, we had like barrel vaults in some of Romanesque architecture. Groin vaults are the meeting of two barrel vaults. And then what they'll do is they'll put really thin sort of skeleton um, structure we call that ribbed groin vaults on the edges of that vault to strengthen that ceiling so that it doesn't fall down. Um, a good example of this is that um, these ceilings were incredibly heavy. And if you guys remember last year that Notre Dame caught on fire, it was so hot it melted the lead roof that was on the ceiling. And that was done in this groin vault. So they were really heavy. So they needed all these structural things in order to hold up those heavy ceilings. Not all are lead, some were stone as well. Um, there's an introduction of the use of flying buttresses. Flying buttresses are exterior supports, and I'll show you those today when we look at charts. And that allows the interior structures to become even more tall because they have these exterior supports. It basically directs the weights from the top of the church to the ground. 
And then the concept of lightness, we will notice that there's a lot thinner details. If you remember, Romanesque architecture is chunky right? It's beefy. It's muscular. And so we're going to see thinner details in the Gothic. We're going to see walls dissolve. So areas that would have had thick masonry, thick stone before, are going to be dissolved into stained glass. And so the stained glass is going to fill entire spaces, and it's going to create kind of this otherworldly effect. So during um, the Gothic era, um, there is St. Denis. We're going to see St. Denis really fast. It was the first Gothic church. And um, the patron of that church, he studied um, a Greek philosopher. He actually thought he was someone else. Like he was reading about, um, he thought it was actually a Christian scholar, but instead it was a Greek scholar. And um, he was reading about how um, light and numbers um, can be symbolic. And so light becomes the light of God. And so in this writing, they studied about how light can convey this essence of God. And so that becomes a real emphasis on the architecture of the Gothic era, as well as divine harmony. So we'll see lots of threes and fours and twelves, um, mathematical harmony to represent divineness and religious um, symbolism. Okay. So during the Gothic era, one of the reasons they could achieve such greatness, and I think one of the things that we noticed too with like the reconstruction of um, Notre Dame in Paris is the rise of the artisans. Um, you know, people don't even, can't really even fathom how they constructed some of these large cathedrals, um, the different building practices. One of the reasons for this is that there were specific artisans who specialized in just stained glass in masonry, in sculpture. And so we have artists starting to be elevated. You probably have noticed that we haven't had too many names of architects since, or art, artists since the Greeks, right? There've been these nameless people. Um, and we've just had a few sprinkled here and there. So we're gonna start to see after the Gothic era and the rise of the artisans, we're gonna know the names of the important architects and artists and sculptors and so on. Um, we have uh, the rise of urban areas. We talked about this a little bit in the Romanesque. This is the start where people are moving away from agrarian society and moving to the cities. Um, scholasticism, um, remember that we just had the introduction of colleges and universities, and so there's a continuation of this. You know, the wealthy um, educate their children either at home or in, um, you know, like um, schools in the community. And then, of course, Romanesque architecture is a major influence of Gothic as well. Remember that that's all rooted in that religious devotion. Right. So here is Saint Denis. Saint Denis is on the outskirts of Paris. Um, one of the towers is missing, but um, it's not an enormous church. It actually is important to the um, it's important to the French monarchy. There are several churches in the city of Paris that are somehow connected to the power system. And I believe that this is, if I remember right, I think this is the burial spot of some of the kings. And so when you look at the exterior, you might be able to notice that this is the Saint Aton, this is a Romanesque church on the left here, that it is organized based on divine numbers. Who can give me a divine number that they see visually represented? So numbers, just throw it in the chat, it's fine. What are some divine numbers you see? I have a bunch of threes popping up, that's very good. So notice how the facade is vertically divided into threes. Those vertical posts that we see are called buttresses. These are not the flying buttresses, but these are added supports. Hagia Sophia has those too, right? Where it's these pilasters that are attached to the exterior of a church that allow for the interior space to be taller. So those, you know, there's four of those divided into three. And then if you look at those spaces, each of those spaces are divided into horizontal threes, right? In things like portals and arches and rose windows. And then the towers themselves are mostly divided into threes as well. 
right? So this is Abbot Suger, and he was the patron of um, the very first Gothic church, which is St. Denis. And the reason I bring this is that he is the one who was studying um, who he thought was St. Denis. Um, but in actually, actuality, he was studying um, the pseudo Dionysus, so this Greek philosopher. And so in him studying the, um, this Greek philosopher, remember that he emphasized numerical harmony and this concept of divine light. We call it lux nova. So in French, it's called lux nova. And the foundation of stained glass is really rooted into that. And so many stained glass windows, and you can even write this. If you look in your note takers at Chartres Cathedral, we have some imagery of stained glass. And one of the functions of stained glass is to connect the patron to the building. So often we see imagery of the patron. So it could be the French monarch. It could be a religious figure like Abbot Suger. Um, it could be, um, sorry, someone bumped out. Um, so it could be anyone who is a part of the building or the patronage of it. Um, we'll have other functions of stained glass as well. So he was an advisor to um, the king. So you can see he was an advisor to Louis VI and Louis VII. So he's actually, in this image that's at Saint Denis, he's actually holding a stained glass window, right? So it's kind of proving that he's connected to this idea of divine light, right? So here is the concept of divine light that we call lux nova, right? So Suger believed that the universe consists of the father of light, right? So God, the first person of God, then his, then um, after him is Christ, and then the smaller lights are the light of the people. So this idea that we have the supreme light, which is God, then a slightly lesser light, Jesus, and then the smallest lights are everyone else. And so these large Gothic windows are sp supposed to represent this transformational quality of light. Because think about light is white, right? When it comes from the sun, it will travel through these windows. And what does it do? When it comes through the stained glass windows, what does it do? It transforms, right? So it's this transformative sort of quality of the religious experience, right? So it's heavenly light. It's heavenly Jerusalem inside the interiors of these Gothic churches, right? So this is the ambulatory. Remember that um, the Romanesque Church of St. Foy had an ambulatory. One of the major things that we'll see different about um, these Gothic churches is that the ambulatories are much more open, right? So here we have Conk on the left, and then on the right, we have St. Denis. Notice how there's much, like there's a lot less of the masonry and there's much more open spaces where the light shines through. You can really see through a Gothic church a lot more than you can a Romanesque church. Romanesque church, you get all blocked by those um, compound um, columns and um, masonry. So here you can see the difference in that ambulatory. Look how open it is. Notice how there's those thin little columns dividing up all the different sections rather than big, massive, chunky masonry that blocks your view. So it has a very open and light feel to it, right? Because there would be a sense of lightness coming through. I think that that's something that we probably should talk about a little bit too, or at least I'll talk about, is this concept of Gothic. Um, you know, in history or in contemporary days, when we think about someone as being Gothic, we normally think about someone as being dark, right? They're dark, they wear black, um, they hate the world, <laughs> um, you know, sort of like something hard, something edgy, but Gothic became dark because of this concept that we had on the Middle Ages, which is archaic, right? We know that the Dark Ages were not as dark as we think that they were. There was a lot of um, information and education and um, 
there was a lot of things happening in places around the world outside of Europe. Um, this concept of dark ages comes from a European point of view. And so a lot of interiors of, of Gothic churches were viewed as being super dark inside because they were dirty. Hundreds of years of candle wax and insects, incense um, darkened the windows darken the architecture. So when they clean those things, they're like, wow, it's light, it's bright, it's beautiful. And so Gothic churches are not about darkness, they're about light. And opening up those spaces really does help that. So here you can see the major differences in the floor plan of a Romanesque church versus a Gothic church, right? Um, there is still a cross. You guys see it? You guys see the cross? All right, see there's a cross. We still have a central nave and we still have a transept, but instead of being divided as much like this, it's much more open with these large side aisles and the side aisles instead don't really wrap around it. They just continue through the transept. So it creates a much more open sort of space rather than very module and chunky. All right. So here is our first image um, for the 250 um, for Gothic and we have the Chartres Cathedral. Um, the Chartres Cathedral is actually called Notre Dame, right? But of course, in our 250, we don't call it Notre Dame because everyone thinks Notre Dame is in Paris. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of Notre Dames around the world, right? It just means Holy Wisdom of Holy Mother. They're all dedicated to Mary, right? So these churches are dedicated to Mary. So how is power conveyed in Notre Dame? Let's look at this view for a second. How is power conveyed? Who wants to share? How do we know that the church is important? It's taller than all the other buildings around. Right. And it's, it's gigantic, right? And so people show the religious devotion by paying taxes and paying, you know, um, um, they would donate money into the construction of this church. It actually took 400 years to construct this church. Um, there was a fire here that um, it was starting to be built. There was a fire and then they rebuilt a section and continued it. So that kind of slowed things down. Um, there was a lot of taxation and riots because people got really sick of being taxed over it. And so there would be, you know, time periods where no construction was happening whatsoever because there was a lack of funds or civil unrest. Um, and, you know, besides it being large, right? those towers, right? We talked about it when we looked at um, St. Foy, is when you're taking your pilgrimage, right? And people would take pilgrimages to Chartres too. So I wanna make sure you understand this is a pilgrimage church as well as a congressional, uh, congregational church that people would go to because they lived in Chartres. You know, you would be walking around um, the terrain and then from a distance, you would see this building because of those tall spires, right? that would be like beacons that you're like, oh, that's my destination. So we have those tall towers at the front of the church. Notice how the crossing tower disappeared. There's no crossing tower at Chartres. There was a crossing tower at Notre Dame in Paris though. You might have noticed, remember that? Remember how it fell and everyone was upset when it fall, fell over? Do you guys remember the video footage of that? Anyway. Um, there's a video here for Art of the Western World, which I know is copyrighted, so I'm not going to watch it with you guys today um, because I have to record. Um, but feel free to watch that if you want some other information. All right. So um, context. Um, it is basically a transitional building. Some parts of it have characteristics of early Gothic and other parts of it have characteristics of high Gothic. Um, I wouldn't really get too caught up with, you know, being able to show the differences. I think because there really is only one Gothic church that they're gonna always have you compare it against something Romanesque or early Christian 
or re Renaissance or something later. So um, one of the things I'll just point out about your exterior here of the church is that it's rather simplistic in its decoration. I will quickly show you some other Gothic churches. We're skipping 60 um, in our study guides because no images of the 250 are on it, but I'll run through some of it. I deleted a lot of it and then showed it again today because I want us to see beautiful things today. Um, but notice how there's a lot of buttressing on the facade of the front of the church, and there's not a lot of architectural detail. So that's kind of an early Gothic kind of transitioning from the Romanesque where we have, you know, most of the architectural details in the portals or the, the entryways into the churches. All right. So why was Chartres Cathedral built and what, why did pilgrims go there. Now, I did not make you have homework over um, the spring, over the winter break, so I assume most of you didn't do the reading for this. But does anyone know what is, um, what the relic is at Chartres Cathedral? Does anyone know? It is the Shroud of Mary. So it's a pilgrimage church, right? It's a pilgrimage church, and it has a relic of the Shroud of Mary. And so, when it, the building caught on fire, fire did not touch this shroud of Mary. So it really even made it like, like even more divine. Obviously, it was a divine object to begin with, right? This shroud of Mary. And so um, because it wasn't rebuilt, it wasn't caught on fire. It was proof that Mary wanted the church to be rebuilt. And so that was some of the motivation um, that the the monarch not the, not just the monarchy but the the uh, religious um, elite you know they really said we have to rebuild this church because Mary wants us to. So here is a manuscript painting of um, construction. This is from our building. So like there's different artisans who did the the masonry and so on. And this shows you some of the stylistic changes from Romanesque all the way to what we call High Gothic. Um, so thinking about the exterior, right? How is it similar to, to Romanesque? I should have put St. Foy there at, and instead of St. Etan. I need to edit that. Um, but notice how similar they are, right? They're divided into three, right? They have that buttressing and masonry, but then you start to see that as we move into high Gothic, which we don't have in our, our image set, notice how the walls are all sculpted. So the buttresses are no longer plain and sparse. They have sculpture, they have sculptural relief, and they're very ornamental, right? They have lots of thin, delicate details to them, right? So, you, besides the front of the church, you also have the portal. What's the function of portal decoration? Why do we have this above the doorway? Do you guys remember that from Romanesque? What's the function of this stuff? Right? It teaches right? It teaches the religious doctrine of the church, right? It prepares you for the entry, entrance into the church. So it spiritually prepares you. And then it also decorates, right? It decorates. Now, the imagery that we typically see in Gothic does not scare people as much as the Romanesque, okay? It's not as scary. It's not as much like hellfire and damnation as we saw at St. Foy or at um, St. Atun with Gislibertus. Right? So, content. Um, the capitals. The tops of these little mini columns that we have that are like engaged on these posts that separate the three doors, they all have scenes based on the life of Mary and Jesus. So they have some religious content there, right? So they're going to tell the stories of their life. So that kind of ties all three of these doors together. 
right? What are some of the differences that we see between a portal decoration from the Gothic to, or from Romanesque to Gothic? What are some stylistic differences that you see? Does anyone want to share one? The pointed arches versus like the rounded out arches. Right. And in all honesty, they wouldn't have to put a pointed arch on a doorway, right? They don't really need that structurally because it's not that tall of a structure. But so it's just this continuation of what you, the style that you would see on the interior of the church on the exterior church. And there's that emphasis on the use of pointed arches. So they use that for decorative elements as well. Thank you, Varun. Right. Notice in that pointed arch, right? We have the archivolts, right? The archivolts at St. Foy had those little like watchers. Remember those little people kind of peeking through? But that's pretty simplistic, right? But here it's filled with sculptural relief, right? So there's a lot of decorative elements to it, right? Um, another thing that you'll probably notice is that there's just less visual information. In a lot of the Romanesque portals, they would insert as much information about heaven and hell as possible. And in Gothic, they, they typically kind of simplify and put different stories in the tympium above that doorway. So we have a lintel, Right, and if you notice the lentil is divided into fours with three people in each section, right? And then we have one story in the center rather than, you know, heaven and hell and all these examples of sin and all these examples of history. So there's just a lot less like visual information. It's a lot less dense. Doesn't mean it's not as decorative though. Right, so in your portal, right, we have different parts. On the left side, the left side's a theme is based on the ascension of Christ, okay? So I wanted to make sure that we knew what the ascension was. So when Jesus dies, right, remember that he's reborn three days later, right? So he comes back to life, and he lived on earth for 40 more days. But after those 40 days, he arose back into heaven. So this is imagery of him, right, rising up into the heavens, okay? And, and that's the part that's in the central part. So you see these angels and you see this cloud and it's kind of like pushing him up into the heavens, right? In the archivolt, right, there are the 12 signs of the zodiac, right? And the zodiac, um, you know, represents, um, you know, the 12 months or the 12 divisions of the year. It also has the labors of the months. So there was like specific jobs that you did within the months. Why would there be an imagery of Jesus arising into heaven connected with time? What does that symbolize? Any ideas? It symbolizes that he's the ruler of heaven and earth for all time. Right? The, the middle, right? So this is going to be the center, is the second coming of Christ. So this is coming from um, Revelations. If you notice, we have a Jesus that looks very similar to the Jesus that we saw at St. Foy. Notice he's in that full body mandola, right? So that full body, body halo. His hand is in blessing, right? And then the other hand is kind of in damnation, right? With the gospel book. He's got the, um, the nimbus, right? The, the, the halo with the cross in it. And then who is around him? We have an ox, we have a lion, we have an angel, we have an eagle. Who are those four people? They are the evangelists, right? So the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four writers of the gospel books, 
right? And then in the Archivolt, we have the divine number of 24. So these are the 24 elders of the apocalypse. And then in the lintel, we have the apostles. So the followers of Jesus, his 12 disciples, and they're in four groups of three. So divine numbers, 12s, 24s, 4s, and 3s. And this is all coming from the, from, um, the Bible. On the right side, we have Mary and throne. So this church is dedicated. Not only is it a pilgrimage church, but it is dedicated to Mary. So the Shards Cathedral is devoted to her. And in the medieval period, in the Gothic period, as well as the Byzantine, there is a elevation of Mary. We call it the Marian devotion. In the Bible, they never really talk about Mary being divine. So in a lot of Catholic and Orthodox um, um, like religious doctrine, she has this kind of elevated status during this time period. And she becomes the bearer of God or the Theotokos. Um, she's often shown on the throne of wisdom. So she's like full of knowledge. And so you see her enthroned in the very center, holding a baby Jesus on her lap, surrounded by angels. So in the lintel, we have scenes based on Jesus's life. We have um, the Eucharist um, in the very center of that. And then in the Archivolts, we have learned men. So we have imagery of scholarship on the Archivolt surrounding it. So we have Ascension, we have um, the Second Coming, so we have Revelations, and we have Mary, so major teachings of the day. Right? And on the, we, you know, we've been talking about the top part here. On these um, entryways, we have what we call colonnettes or jam figures. So jam figures are these little columns that typically have sculptural elements to it. Sometimes the columns become people. These ones actually have these sculptures that are kind of superimposed in the front of the column. So they're very tall and skinny taking on the shape. And they're basically there to welcome people to the church. The ones at Chartres are um, prophets and ancestors of Jesus and Mary. They're, they're basically considered to be the religious royalty. So notice that a lot of them are wearing crowns as well as halos. So one of the things we'll, we'll see from um, early Gothic, and then I'll quickly show you some high, high Gothic in just a little bit, is that we, the sculptures become much more realistic. These are very like stylized because they look like columns. Here's some that are on the transepts. So remember the transepts, the cross, crossing um, area, there's doorways there. And so you can see some of these other ones look much more 3D. Okay, so here's the exterior parts of a Gothic church. Um, we have talked about these parts already. This is in your textbook, but I just want to pinpoint some of the elements that are new to Gothic. Um, if we go through, we talked about the portal, we talked about the jam. Number three is the rose window. Those circular Gothic windows that we're used to seeing are called rose windows, and they are all typically dedicated to Mary, this idea of Mary and devotion. They're supposed to be taking on the shape of a rose, right? And a rose is symbolic of Mary. Um, we have gables before, we have thinner elements, so we have um, this emphasis on the vertical. Notice how the tops of these um, towers, as well as the little towers um, that are on the transepts, all have this element of verticality to them. Um, they have little, what we call finial, so like the tops, like the top of like a, um, like a staircase, you know, like the post, it has those little tops to it, right? The decorative, I'm like staring at one right now. I wish I could just turn my camera to it, right? But can you see it under my light, right? See that little ball on the, through the light, right? Those little finials, there's all these vertical elements, so like these spiky sort of elements to them in 
um, Gothic architecture and everything forces your eye up towards um, the heavens. And so if we look right here, right, can you guys see this right here is that flying buttress. So the flying buttress is an extra architectural support that typically connects to the top of the church right? So right underneath the roof. And what it does is it takes the weight of the ceiling and it pulls it out away from the church and then down to the ground. And so connected to the ground, we normally have these buttresses. Um, look how thick the masonry is on those single buttresses. So what that does is it takes the weight from the tall ceiling and shifts it out into the ground instead of having it collapse into the interior of the church. Just making sure I didn't skip anything else that's new or different. Right, so we have lots of pinnacles and finials. Where is that on your diagram here? Oh, they have it really down here, which is hard to see. All right, so here is, um, I don't think this is part, I think the top one here is the image that you guys have um, in the 250 to illustrate it, but here's a one I think from our textbook. So you can really see those um, flying buttresses, how they come out from the ceiling and then go down and then see how thick that masonry is. We even have that in the apse area, right? And the reason for that is it allows for large windows. So basically in between each of those buttresses, you're gonna have large stained glass windows. So here is the plan for charts. Um, one of the things you might notice is it's divided into 12 in um, the central nave. We have it divided obviously into three with numerical harmony as well. And you'll notice that it is much more open compared to right? A Gothic or a Romanesque church, right? It's less chunky. <clears throat> so especially in the ambulatory and then the apps end of the church, um, lot, a lot less masonry, right? So here is the interior image that you guys have for um, a Gothic church, right? So this is the interior of Chartres. What are the characteristics of a Gothic interior. There's gonna be a lot of similarities to something that's Romanesque, right? It's still medieval, right? So we're looking for variations from it. So we have the introduction of the pointed arch. Doesn't mean the pointed arch didn't exist in an earlier time period, but it becomes much more heavily used in Romanesque art, or excuse me, in Gothic architecture. We have the continuous open space. Notice how easy it is to see inside to the side aisles compared to um, how hard it is to see in a Romanesque church. There's an emphasis on the vertical. We have those ribbed groin vaults. So if we go up to the ceiling, all the skeleton elements to it, it even feels kind of decorative in a way, also adds structural support to that ceiling. And of course that allows for it to be more like taller, right? There's thinner details. So those compound piers, it still has compound piers, but instead of being like big, chunky colonnettes bundled with different colonnettes, instead there's some thinner, delicate imagery included. And even the transverse arches that go from the floor to the ceiling, they're really like a bundle of thin ones rather than one big giant one, right? They are use of stained glass windows. So notice here, can you see above the gallery or the triforium that we have here, there's large clerestory windows and they fill the walls, right, with this divine light. So there's a lot less masonry. Um, that second story, that gallery above the side aisle, sometimes it's divided into four, which I think this is as well, but sometimes it's divided into three, which is called a triforium. So of course, four and three are divine numbers. So just like the sectioning of the windows that kind of allow you to see in and out um, are in divine numbers. 
So those are your got your like your new characteristics or the things that help you kind of differentiate the differences between Romanesque and Gothic. All right. So I should have had this one first. How are they different? Right? What are the differences? Rounded versus pointed, right? Much more open. Notice how you can't even see through the side aisle here, right? That masonry just gets in the way. And then notice how you can really see the altar or the apse end, how open it seems at Shards compared to at St. Foy, right? So how is the Clara story different? Here's an illustration of the Clara story. Remember the Clara story is that open area, typically windows between the roof and the gallery, right? So notice how the windows are enormous. So do you remember when we did the difference between post and lentil, rounded, pointed it? If you did this with a, a friend or a family member and you illustrated this for you, yourself, you would find that you cannot break this, right? There's no way to put pressure on the top of this and get your hands to separate, right? So pointed arches are much more structurally sound than rounded arches, right? So remember that the main functions of stained glass, right, is to transform ordinary light into divine light and to teach, right? So transform, it has a transformative, like a physical transformative quality. So it creates regular light into something more divine, right? It goes from white light to jewel tones, right? But it also teaches. So it could teach you biblical teachings. It could teach you about history. It could teach you about patronage, right? I should add patronage there too. So under number two, teachings, belief, history, patronage are a lot of the things that we see um, in the stained glass. So at Chartres or at St. Denis, remember we had patronage imagery of Abbot Suger. At, no, um, at St. Chapelle, or it's not St. Chapelle, excuse me, at Chartres, we have imagery of biblical teaching. So the image that you guys have um, in your 250 for stained glass comes from Chartres, and it is called Notre Dame de la Belle. So I think, well, I should have looked this up. I can't remember which image you guys have. Do you guys have the full image or do you have the close up in your note takers? Who can help me out? And then we have the close-up. You guys got the close-up. Okay, so I'll sh so what I'll show you is um, the full one is on the right side. This is called a lancet window. So lancet windows are tall and skinny and have a pointed arch at the top. I just want to show the difference between like a rose window, which is the round one, and then the tall skinny one, which is very stereotypical Gothic. So you can go to this website um, to get some research on it. I'm just going to tell you because we're, we're, we have to get to another section today too. Um, but there are three major themes of imagery on this, um, in this one stained glass window, right? So the major themes that are included are the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, the wedding at Cana, and then Mary enthroned. So those are the major stories. Now in this window, there is absolutely no connection between these themes. So it's not like, oh, they put these things together to tell us about the miracles of Jesus. Like there is no overarching theme. They are like three separate biblical teachings, which is pretty common. Like there are some windows that are all based on a theme, and then there are others that are more sporadic like this one. So you notice, and especially in the close-up that we were given, is that we can see the elevation of Mary. So in the name of this window, it has Notre Dame, which is Holy Mother, 
right? It means, you know, uh, the, like the grand lady. It's all about Mary here. And so when you see the image, how is she emphasized, right? How do we know that Mary is the most important image here, right? And this will give us some of those common characteristics about how Mary is represented in the Middle Ages. How is she shown as being important? Who can help me out? She's the largest figure. She's the largest. She's enthroned, right? She's got a halo. Um, she takes up three panes of stained glass. Notice how everyone else gets one section. We call this tracery, the thing that holds the stained glass in place. And she gets three of those, right, where everyone else gets one. Right? And you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities in the style of the stained glass compared to the sculptural decoration. A lot of the artisans would design stained glass, but some of them also just des were designers. So they might design stained glass and architectural decoration. And so there's a lot of similarities. Of course, they were being built at the same time in the same locations too. Right? So this is held together in what we call bar tracery. So that's those horizontal and vertical elements that hold those um, patterns of glass together. And then plate tracery is stone that is cut into place. We don't have um, any examples of that in ours, but you can see that the bottom of this does have um, bar tracery as well, right? This is also at Chartres, and this one um, links the royal family to the holy family. So here's other imagery of how politics are included often in um, stained glass. If you notice, in these little lancet windows, there's fleur-de-lis, and then in the next, there's little castles, and that's from Blanche of um, Queen Blanche of um, Castile. So she is actually from Spain, and so the castles are there to represent her. But there's all these images of the Holy Family um, depicted in this rose window and series of lancets. Right? So that is Chartres Cathedral. Any questions? Okay. Um, so we are going to move through this fast because I still took more time than I wanted. I just wanted to show you some other Gothic churches. Here's Reims, so you can see high Gothic, how decorative the exterior is compared to like Chartres, right? This is the interior. So this is the transept area of Reims. So when you walk in and what's at your back is this wall of sculptures and these beautiful large rose windows. I think Reims is where the French monarchy um, are coronated. So it's also connected to the French monarchy. So the interior, all those little reliefs and uh, sculptures that are on the wall here have these little niches and they have um, medieval knights all in three dimensional. You can see how the sculptures are much more realistic now. So we can see that classical tendencies don't disappear, right? They're just decided when they're going to be used. And the Reims Church has four really important exterior sculptures um, that I wish we could talk about in depth. Um, but it, could, it shows us kind of the styles of the time. And this is called the smiling angel style. It's probably one of the most awkward things I've ever seen, but this is the style of the French monarchy. And so that will pertain to what we see in just a few moments. So notice how the head is small and it's in a triangle and it's this little smiley kind of angel, angelic sort of face. This is the style of the French monarchy. This style is often considered to be kind of like archaic Greek. And then these two are considered to be much more like classical, so like Roman realistic, because you'll see that they look much more realistic. So this is like Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, and she had her child when she was old, and so she looks physically old here. So that's the interior reams. And then the largest church um, that we really have is the Amens Cathedral. And I think the ceiling of this is like 130 feet tall. And it's got these large 
um, elevation to it and it has these really large windows. Um, I think the reason they gave us shards rather than let's say amens or reams is that a lot of the stained glass is no longer original. Um, during World War II so many of these um, uh, windows were broken um, through explosions. So, um, but you can see here how the top Claire story is pretty much just windows. Like there's very little masonry holding it all together. But I think you get the idea of the emphasis on height and light by seeing this ceiling shot of Amens. This is the portal of Amens. This is high, so you can see how decorative it gets. Um, it has some very realistic um, Trumeau figures. That's a Romanesque Trumeau figure, so you can see the difference, right? And then um, there are styles of Gothic. And so this is probably my happy Gothic. This is called Radiant Gothic. And um, this is a reliquary church. So this was the, for the French monarchy. This was for Louis the Ninth, And he had the relics of the crown of Jesus, as well as other, like those with the thorns of Jesus, as well as other relics of Jesus kept in this chapel called Saint Chapelle. So if you go to Paris, this is a must, you must go to it. It looks like a reliquary inside. It is got like all this architecture is covered in gold leaf. The ceiling is bright blue with like little um, fleur de lis and like stars in the ceiling. Um, and then the windows, like it basically goes, it has no gallery. So it has like a first story and then it just has windows from the first story all the way to the ceiling. And it just has this jewel like sort of quality, right? And then flamboyant Gothic, this is in Milan. And so flamboyant Gothic, flamboyant means flame-like. And so there's this real emphasis on the vertical here. So it's very decorative and very ornate. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, we do need to move into the next area. We'll see how far we get. If not, I'll record some of it for Monday as well. We're gonna be looking at objects of wealth and power in the Gothic. Uh, this is a reliquary at St. Denis, and I just wanted to show you that this would have held a relic of Mary, um, but I wanted to point out that there was still classical tendencies during the Gothic period. So we can see that sculptures did have a real sense of realism and proportion and delicacy to the detail, um, and it wasn't just chunky and hard to see and, you know, crude. Um, there was a lot of um, of detail to these objects. Okay, so that takes us to a manuscript page that we have. Um, we actually have um, a dedication page and then we have a series of images from the, um, the, the Bible Moralis or the, the Morality Bible. And so the first page that we have is called the dedication of page of Blanche of Castile, so that woman we were just talking about at Chartres Cathedral, the Queen, um, and Louis the Ninth. And so this is the dedication page for that. So what does that mean? Louis the Ninth um, took his power from his mother. His father died when he was quite young, and so he was too young to become the King of, of France. So she ruled so Queen Blanchett ruled as the regent for a while, and then she educated her son on how to become the king. So she is the basically the patron of this pay, or of this book that he she had created for him, and the whole function of just this page is to show that he that she dedicated this entire book to him and to his knowledge of how to be a good king. Right, so she's teaching him how to how to be the right king, or correct king. Right, so this is I'm gonna, sorry I'm going to go back. This is called a Bible Moralis. I apologize, my French is not good. Right, which basically means it's a moralized Bible. So moralized Bibles were quite popular. They basically are selections from the Bible. We haven't really seen, right? We've seen 
books of the Bible. You know, we've seen Vienna Genesis, we've seen gospel pages like Lynn's Farms, which is just four books of the Bibles. So a lot of these illustrated books weren't the whole Bible, they were just sections of it. So these were typically sections that would teach morals to someone. So a lot of them are from the New Testament. They would be the teachings, um, like the parables of Jesus, things that would teach you right versus wrong. So these were used to educate people, right? So this was made um, for the French uh, royal family, right? And it has different stories and passages from the Old and New Testament. Um, and so it visually kind of um, tells these different stories um, to convey teachings or convey morals. Um, you too can buy one of these. So you can buy a recreated version of this right here if you really want to. I sometimes watch, have us watch this video, video, but we don't have time. Okay, so how does it reflect the taste of the French monarchy? And how does it look very similar to Byzantine art? Keep in mind that we've talked about Byzantine, but Byzantine basically is the same time period as this, right? It's not after, it's happening at the same time. So how does this look like it's powerful and elite and royal? What are some of the characteristics that you see? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. Lots of gold, very good Jasmine. Anything else? It has the style of that silly little ream sculpture that I talked, that smiling angel. So notice that it has jewel tones, right? It feels very vivid, right? So like a reliquary, it has bright jewel-like tones. It has the gold that Jasmine mentioned. It has the triangle-shaped heads. So the smiling sort of, sort of angel style. This was the French monarchy style. And it does have characteristics of the Byzantine in that it's very flat. So we do have, we basically have four people sitting in these trifoil arches and then we have a city behind it. So we do have a setting, but there's a re it's rather flat, right? It doesn't have a real depiction of space. Um, it has that filled in space full of the gold and it's very formal. So it's highly organized in its composition and arrangement. Right? So what is depicted at the very top? Who do we have? Who's on this page or on the top of this page? We have Queen Blanchet, Blanchet, our, and then we have King Louis the Ninth. So we have, right, the patron and who it's dedicated to. And they're at the top, right, because they're in elevated status. He holds a scepter and they're both crowned and enthroned, right? And they often sort of mimic how the royal family is depicted. This is a portal at Saint-Chapelle, that radiant Gothic jewel tone masterpiece I showed you, right? And then at the very bottom, what's depicted here? It looks a lot like the Lindisfarne Gospel. Do you remember when we had our gospel writer writing, right? This is the creation of this moral, moralized Bible. So we have a religious monk dictating to a scribe what should be the contents of this religious book, right? So we have the making of it, which is befitting of a dedication page. So then inside the pages, we have scenes from um, the apocalypse. And so notice how it's organized in rows, like stained glass windows. It's organized in sections. Right? And there's going to be visual information with text right next to it. So it's going to have this sort of like ways to explain, right, the information. Now, I want to make sure that I remember to tell you that the imagery is not from the same book. I don't know why they put these together, right? 
they call these both, they, they're coming from Bible moralysis, but this is not the imagery from the one dedicated to the king. This is from another book. And um, so just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and so once we look at smart history, they actually show other examples as well, right? So this is on the smart history article. And so we'll kind of breeze through it really quickly for you. So it has a theme for the pages. Oh, I have it. Oh, sorry. My computer is freaking out a little bit. Okay, so the theme of this page that we have in our image set is based on revelations. So remember, Revelations is the last book of the Bible. It's the last book of the New Testament. And so it has the stories of John's visions, right? So basically, um, there is imagery of John taking a tour with an angel. And so here he's going to be see, seeing like the ends of days. So there's imagery that alludes to the ends of days, to the end of the world. So that's the theme here, right? So how is it organized? There is a sense of organization, like there's a logical way that each of these pages are represented. And so I don't think you have to memorize how it's organized. I think you just need to know that it's organized um, this way. So basically in the, the upper section is from the Old Testament and then the lower section is from the New Testament. And so they're gonna to try to create parallels between the old and the new. And so there's always some text and some sort of social commentary. Often when we look at the imagery close up, the imagery of the people in these don't necessarily look like they come from the Old or the New Testament. They could be like medieval people. So in this one here, we have monks. I can tell because they have the shaved heads. And so a lot of the imagery has people. So like, as I would be like learning from this, I would be able to see myself or see people I know within the imagery. Right? And then how do they reflect the, the days? Um, so um, they, how do they reflect the time in which they were made? They compare people and events with the Bible with contemporary medieval life. So what I was just saying about how you can kind of see yourself. Um, there's anti-Semitic imagery. Often the bad guys in some of these Bibles were seen as the Jews um, and or corrupt priests of the medieval era. Um, and so they would, you can see their religious and um, political biases incorporated in a lot of these as well. Um, stylistically, they don't have a lot of realistic space. Normally, the, the cities are in miniature. So here you can see towns really small, just kind of indicated at the top so we know that they take where they take place. Um, but they're very unproportional. So the people tend to be gigantic and the settings tend to be very small. And then they tend to be very jewel-like. So thinking about form, right? They're unproportional, but they still have bright blues, bright reds, golds, and so on. So this is some of the imagery. Um, that's a little bit more specific. So we have images of revelations where demons are damning um, people to hell. So there's a corrupt king, right? And a corrupt bishop over here. And then we have Christ teaching the faithful. So then here's some of the other examples that are on smart history. So you can see that these are very typical, right? So the last image that we have for today is actually a, the only Jewish artwork that we have in the 250. Um, just like Islamic art, there's not a lot of figurative imagery 
um, in Jewish art because of the Ten Commandments. And so what we had is the Golden Haggadah. Um, there's a virtual book that we can click on if you're interested in looking at it. I also have it linked to Smart History later. Um, you guys don't have flashcards, so we'll skip this part. But we're going to be able to define what each of those three images are all about. But let's just focus first on a few um, vocabulary terms. Does anyone know what a Haggadah is? Does anyone know what a Haggadah is? Right? Um, it's a Jewish text, um, basically means the narration in Hebrew right? It is used at the Seder. So the Seder is um, meals that are have that happen in the two nights um, of the Jewish Passover. And so in the Haggadah, there's going to be stories of the Exodus. So the Exodus is where the Jews leave Egypt with Moses, right? So Passover is a Jewish festival that commemorates that Exodus from Egypt. And so it's um, like in the Bible, um, it is in, so Genesis, Exodus, it's the second book of the Christian Bible. And then of course it's in um, the Hebrew Bible as well, or the Hebrew book, right? And so remember that Seder um, is this meal, right? But it's more than a meal, it's a ceremony, it's a ritual, and it's performed by the community or different generations of family. Um, in the retelling of the story. So a Haggadah is an educational book that's used at home or in the community to teach about the Exodus. So this would be, you know, so function, but also some context. All right. So this book is really beautiful, as well as really well done. Not all Haggadahs look like this, but this came from a very wealthy Jewish family in Spain. And so they were able to show their wealth and status in how beautiful this book was decorated. Um, it's real common for these books to look very worn. Um, this one's in relatively good condition because it's used at a meal with family. So I think it's on Smart History. There's a video, they, there's a video discussion on it. They talk about like, you know, normally there's like splashes of wine on it and smears of food, right? Because it's used at a family gathering. So this one's in quite, quite um, relatively um, good condition. So you would open this during times of the Seder um, in order to use it as an educational tool, but there would be different um, prayers that could be read from it um, in different parts of that feast and ceremony, right? So um, we have three different pages. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this first page here. And so if you have your note takers out, um, you have to look at what this page looks like to be able, and then maybe what you could do is put right underneath of it, like right here, what the, the theme of this page is. So we have the boils that are afflicted to the Egyptians. We have frogs, pestilence kills domestic animals, and wild animals invade the city. Does anyone know what the theme of these four images are? These are the plagues of Egypt. So these are the plagues that God put onto Egypt when Moses said, can my people go? And, and the, the Pharaoh's like, no. And he goes, well, you're going to get these plagues. And so these are some of the things that happened to the Egyptians. So these are in clockwise, right, from the top left. So here's the boils, the frogs, the killing of animals, and then the invasion of animals, right? So then we have the Pharaoh ordering the Israelites to leave Egypt. We have the plague of the first um, born son. We have the crossing of the Red Sea. And then we have the Egyptians running after them. So this is scenes of the liberation. So this is actual scenes of the exodus it's them, um, happening. So scenes of liberation. 
And then the last theme is the preparation for the Passover. So we have Moses' sister Miriam holding the timbrel. We have the distribution of the matzah. We have the house being prepared for Passover. And we have the sheep, be, uh, sheep being slaughtered. So these would be, um, you know, parts of that uh, Passover festival. Right? So stylistically, what's Gothic about this? What's Gothic and how does it express wealth? Okay. It is highly detailed and highly illustrated, right? There is borders, right? And then there's decorative elements within those borders. Um, there's miniature architecture. So we will breeze through this when we look at painting, but in a lot of this um, Gothic architecture or painting, architecture tends to be very small and out of proportion. Um, so it's like very miniature. And typically it's like the fourth wall is open. So like some of those Islamic manuscripts, we can see inside the interior of the structure like one of the walls or two of the walls are removed so that you can see inside. We also see that it's in the French monarchy style. They have the triangle shaped faces. They look very French to me. They're wearing, even though this was made in Spain for, for Spanish um, people, this has um, a lot of French sort of characteristics. Um, it's very like in the vision of the white man, right? The, their skin is white, their skin is light, um, they've got curly hair, they've got, uh, you know, delicate features, but then we also have those jewel tones. So like the dedication page that we saw, we have vast areas of gold, right? We have those jewel tones with the bright blues and the bright um, reds and so on. So that is it for today. Any questions? Okay. Um, I will see you guys again on Tuesday. So um, make sure that you work on your long essay, right? So make sure you work on your long essay. It is due on Monday. And then I will make a video. Um, it will not be super long, I promise, for 62. I haven't made it yet. But the goal, I always try to do it sooner than later so that you guys can get a jump start on it. You don't have to do it on Monday. Okay. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.